Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Loop and Learn's T1D educational series. Uh, and uh, just for a quick introduction, I'm Joanne Milo, and on tonight with all of us, you will you'll see Marion Barker, Carol Bashan, Tina Hammer, Ellen uh, Broadman, and Mike Plant. You see them in the Facebook group all the time. These are the wonderful people behind helping all of y'all and you just wanted to make sure you knew who they were and they are here tonight. And then we have our special guest again with Gary Shiner uh, from Int Integrated Diabetes Services and author of Think Like a Pancreas. Tonight he's talking about Night Scout, something that we believe all loopers should have access to and understand to help them and help us help you um, work with your settings, understand what your information is, and so we'll go through our usual uh, disclaimer that a loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. This presentation is provided to share tools available to you in the DIY community and assist your, you in making your own decisions in consultation with your healthcare professionals regarding your own diabetes self-management. You take full responsibility for building and running the system and you do so at your own risk. Oops. And tonight, once again, for a return appearance, Gary Shiner. He's been probably our most frequent guest, and we always learn something. Um, and he is discussing Night Scout, which is an extremely useful tool for all loopers, which allows you to see all of your data in one place, real time, so that you can analyze what you've been doing, what you need to change, and print reports for yourself and for your healthcare team. Gary's company, Integrated Diabetes Services, has a full staff, and they are growing, of the CDCESs, which I call CDEs, who live with type 1 diabetes, and um, most are using DIY closed-loop systems and Night Scout. So we're, we're real honored to have this again tonight, and um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put them in chat. Hang on one second. And I want to stop share. There we go. Um, please keep your mics muted uh, because we sometimes pick up a lot of background noise and you can leave your cameras on or turn them off. When Gary feels like he's educated you enough for this evening, then we'll take questions from the chat and um, Ellen and Tina will be following questions over to Gary. So here we go, Gary. Thank you so much for being here again. You're great. Where do I get a shirt like that, Joanne? I love the insulin with wings. Uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. It, it's the young lady you're helping in uh, the Philippines. Oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. All right. Yeah, so a, a lot of my uh, professional colleagues in diabetes, in nursing, endocrinology, they, they always tell me, well, you know, why, why even bother teaching people about analyzing their own data? They're not going to do it. They don't know what to do with the data. And I, I always want to tell them, well, maybe you should take a look at the Loop and Learn group because this is a this is a smart, engaged audience, and uh, they deserve to know what to do with their own data. And I, it's kind of like if a tree falls and no one hears it, does it make a sound? You know, if you've got all this glucose data, all this information, and you don't do anything with it, yeah, who does it benefit? It really doesn't benefit anybody. So uh, I'm going to run through just my own approach to looking at Night Scout data in particular, um, I, I really do like the Night Scout program. Uh, I, I think that it gets me the data that I need for analysis, not just for my patient's data, but for my own. I, I, I look at it as well. Um, so whether you are able to set up a Night Scout program for yourself or you, know, you, you need assistance, there are groups like uh, T1PAL and Night Scout Pro is one that I just learned about. I think you know, they do an excellent job helping get people linked up with, with Night Scout and able to look at their own data. Um, I had a, a client earlier today who's in the UK. So I'm going to use his data as my case study today. So let me do a share screen. Oh, you got to give me the power first to do a share screen. I thought I did. Let me get back to you. You don't have that? Done. Thank you. All right, let's try that again. Let's 
it's this one. Let's see. All right. So you see in a, a night scout thing on screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So well, when you open up your night scout, you know, page, you have to click in the upper right and then select reports. And you know, what, what, once you're in the reports mode, there's a lot of tabs up here more tabs than most people know what to do with, and more tabs than I use also. There's a lot of these that I never even really open or, or look at. Um, there's a few, a few settings in here I always have to customize as well. But honestly, the, the first place I, I go is not the reports themselves. I click on the profile because I want to see what somebody's settings are. And with any of these, you just tap on show and it'll give you the updated report. So I'm able to see what this person's settings are. And I should, I mentioned before, this is someone in the UK. So they're measuring things in millimole. If you're in the States, do not set your target for five. The blood sugar of five is not good if you live in the US. If you're in the UK, a blood sugar of five is pretty nice. And just so you know, to transition between milligram and millimole, there's a factor of 18. If you multiply all of his settings by 18, you'll get the traditional milli, uh, milligram measurements. But I always want to make sure that the settings are you know, correct. You know, I have a record of my patient's settings. I want to make sure that what they're using is what I have in, in my notes. I also want to make sure that there's no glaring uh, errors. It's very easy when you're using a program like Loop to miss a decimal point or tap twice on something. So if somebody's basal is 1.6, and then 16.5 in the next hour, I know something's not right. So it's always worth going and looking at the person's profile just to make sure everything is, is correct. And right now he's only got one carb ratio. It's set unit for every 7.3 grams for everything. And those of you who are looping or just pumping, you know that that rarely works. We usually need different carb ratios at different meals. And I just started working with this guy, so we haven't made those changes yet. Likewise, his correction factor, his sensitivity factor is set at one all the time. Now, that's the equivalent to 18 for the rest of us. And we've got his basal settings here and then his target range uh, down at the bottom. So that's the profile. That's always the first thing I like to look at. The second thing I go to is the week to week report. This is off also called a spaghetti graph. There's a few things I always have to customize first. I need to make sure that the target range is appropriate. For a lot of people in the States, we use a target range of 70 to 180 or 80 to 160 or whatever it might be for you as an individual. In this person's case, we usually use four to 10 as their target range. I also wanna make sure that the reports are set for a linear orientation. By default, a lot of these reports go to a log logarithmic. And what that does is it just enlarges the part of the screen that's showing normal glucose ranges and minimizes the screen that's in the low and the high ranges. And what it does, if you're looking at things in a logarithmic fashion, is it minimizes the severity of the extremes. I don't want that. I want to see what's really happening. So I go to linear, and that way everything shows up equally. I also like to look at the last two weeks rather than just the last one week. And then click on show. And after I hit show, it's going to load all the data. This just takes a moment. And then I can scroll down and see what the spaghetti graphs look like. And we've got two weeks of them to evaluate. And you know, there's some differences from week to week. I mean, in general, the glucose appears to be a little on the high side, especially in the evening. So that carb ratio is using at dinner might need some tweaking. Through the night, the glucose does trend down. So I'll have to see if he's got uh, closed loop mode working or if he's on open loop. If he's on open loop and trending down, that's a sign that his basal is probably set too high. I'm able to see with this type of report what the post-meal patterns are like. Is there a big spike right after eating that then settles back down or are things fairly stable? 
for the most part, we don't have big spikes taking place after the meals. It rises a little bit, but then settles back down again. Uh, same thing for the past week. We have an outlier. There was one night where the glucose shot up really, really high. It was up near 400 for part of the time here. I'm not going to worry so much about that one. I'm looking for what the typical patterns are. And that's one of the reasons I like this, you know, this spaghetti graph, uh, or you know, they call the week to week graph, is you can visually lop out the outliers and see what the typical daily patterns are really like. All right, so I take that one, and it is possible to sort this by days of the week. So if you feel that maybe the weekends are something you want to focus in on, you can always uncheck all of the weekdays, hit show, and then you'll just get a look at what the weekends are doing. For the most part, it's not much different than the rest of the rest of the week. So I'll go ahead and, and put those days back in. There are some other reports such as the uh, distribution where sorting by day of the week can be a little more helpful. So let's look at that one. Distribution is really where all of the stats and averages are located. So I'm gonna click on show. We got two weeks of stats. The average, and we wanna look at the overall average, so the bottom of this table, We've got an overall average of 10.8, uh, which is a little on the high side. That's like a 190 to most of us. Uh, we've got time in range of 44%. Clearly, we want to want to do uh, make improvements there. Now, you might look at the time low and see that it's zero and say, "Wow, that's fantastic." I look at a time in range that's that's that low and time that's low of zero, and I think you know maybe there's some avoidance, there's some anxiety about hypoglycemia here. Likewise, if somebody's time in a high range was 4% and they had a lot of lows, I would think, well, maybe there's some anxiety about high blood sugar. But when I see somebody in a two-week period with not a single glucose value below 4, below 72 in this case, I think you know, there might be some mental blocks that are getting in the way. This person may be very anxious about low blood sugars. But still, you know, we've got the percentages of, of in range, high and low, and always trying to work on improving those from session to session. And the next place I go is to the day-to-day -day reports. Once again, I have to switch from logarithmic to linear. Hit show. And the various reports will show up. And again, since this guy is in the UK, we've only, it's 1 a.m. there. So we've got data right up to 1 a.m. Something I should mention is when you're generating reports in Night Scout, it's important that the clock on your computer match the, the clock on your phone or wherever you're generating your data from with Loop. I struggle with this because I've got patients all over the world. And for this guy, I had to switch the clock on my computer to Scotland time, just because if I didn't have it set that way, none of this data would appear correctly. There'd be blank spots in the, in the basal area. Uh, it, it, the dates wouldn't line up properly. It would be a mess. So make sure your clock on your computer is correct. So he recently switched himself to the auto bolus branch. And when you're using the auto bolus branch, you'll see at the bottom of, of each day's graph, lots of these blue clusters that just show auto boluses that are being delivered to try to correct highs and rising blood sugar levels. The boluses show up as the vertical blue bars. The carbs show up as the vertical red bars. So yesterday, we only had a dinner bolus entry. We didn't eat all day until dinner time. At least that's what we're expected to think. You may have eaten something here and just forgotten to enter it. But at dinner time, we got 50 grams, a 7.7 .7 unit bolus, and he entered a three unit absorption time. I think the last time we did a session, I spoke a little bit about absorption time. And just scrolling down, three hour, three hour, three hour, three hour. So he's clearly not 
adjusting the absorption time at all. So whether he's eating a pizza or a sandwich or potato or whatever, it's something I need to teach him about. Because obviously if you're eating something that absorbs quickly, you need a shorter absorption time. A slower digesting meal, we need a longer absorption time so that the uh, loop algorithm will be able to adapt the upfront bolus and the adjustments that follow accordingly. And typically, if it's a very rapidly digesting meal, I recommend putting in one hour. Going from three hours to two makes very little difference. You have to get down to an hour or even half an hour to have it bump up the upfront bolus and then lower the basal a bit the next few hours. For slower digesting meals, I typically recommend five, six, or seven hours. Going from three to four doesn't make enough of a difference. It doesn't reduce the upfront bolus much at all. You get to about a six or seven hour absorption time. Now you gotta, it's gonna take a good chunk off the upfront bolus and plan to increase the delivery over the next few hours. So each day we're able to see the sensor tracing, we're able to see the outcome from the boluses and the carb entries, and hopefully learn something from that. What I typically do before I have appointments with my patients is I'll run through the last couple of weeks of data and I'll look to see, all right, what happens after the morning meals? What happens after the midday meals? Is the blood sugar in range? Is it running too high? Are there a lot of drops? And is loop having to fight things? Is it having to adjust for highs and lows to keep things in range? That tells me yeah, maybe the bolus, the carb ratio at that meal needs to be changed. So if we're seeing frequent highs after lunch, like yesterday at lunch, he gave his bolus, ate his carbs, three hours, four hours later, the glucose is up around, uh, it's in the low 200s, basically. It's up around 10 or 12. Then the system had to give him a bunch of automated correction boluses to get it back down again. But I consider that an unsuccessful lunch bolus. There wasn't enough insulin. So if I run through the past several weeks and I'm seeing a lot of that, here's another lunch, it was high afterwards. Here's a lunch, it's high afterwards. If I see that happening repeatedly, it tells me you know, the carb ratio at lunch probably needs to be adjusted. And likewise, if I'm seeing either lows after the meal or I'm seeing the system shut off the basal after meals, it tells me that the carb ratio may be too aggressive. Hey, Gary, yeah. why are we not seeing the boluses for Sunday? Oh, I'll tell you. And that's one of the reasons I picked this person's data in particular. You're not seeing automated correction boluses because he switched from temp basal branch to auto bolus branch 10 o'clock on Sunday night. I'm glad you asked that. And I, I did that intentionally. If you're using the auto bolus branch, yeah, you're going to be getting either your normal basal or zero, that, you know, it'll show in white when it cuts down to zero. And it's showing auto boluses to fix highs. Here, when he's in temp basal branch on loop, it's constantly adjusting the basal delivery. So it wasn't delivering his standard basal settings much at all. It was increasing his basal almost all the time. And the day before as well and the day before. So when I look at something like this, let me pick a day. Okay, here, here's, here's a good one. You'll know, what don't you see at all on this particular day? There's no food entries. There's no boluses delivered at all. And trust me, this guy's got a good appetite. He did not fast all day. He most likely ate around one, didn't bolus for it. He let the pump loop try to fix it for him. And for the most part, when you just rely on loop or any algorithm to try to cover a meal, it doesn't work out so well. The blood sugar has a tendency to go up pretty high and stay there for a while. Looks like there's another meal that was eaten around seven. Yeah, the system is bumping up the basil to try to deal with it, but you know it's gonna take a long time for it to get anywhere close to normal after that. 
And this is, you know, I see things like, uh, you know, Medtronic just launched their 780. And they have what they call missed bolus forgiveness, where it thinks, yeah, it's just going to wait until you start rising and then give you a bunch of insulin to deal with it on its own. Now, you're going to spike up real high and it's going to take a while to come down. We still have to bolus for our meals to manage our glucose properly. We're not at the point where we have insulin that's fast enough or an algorithm that's aggressive enough to be able to cover meals without us bolusing for them. I mean, if you're having a bowl of nuts, maybe something that's super slow and doesn't affect the blood sugar that much. But for most foods we eat, we got a bolus for them. Gary, do you think thing it's that shows up nicely oh. in, in these reports is if you're using one of the temp overrides, I use the temp overrides constantly for a lot of different situations. So I can see when he went to the gym and I encourage people to set up temp overrides that are unique for each type of workout. So we might have a running override. We'd have a weightlifting override because you can have different adjustments that need to be made. And when I'm looking at someone's data, I want to know what kind of workout they did. I need that context to be able to figure out what adjustments are going to work best. So for him, Gary? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, for clients who actually record their carbs, is it helpful to turn on the IOB and the COB plots on the day-to-day -day report so people see how the insulin and the carbs are tracking each other? You can do that. I don't think it's really necessary. In fact, I think it clutters up the screen a little too much. When you bolus and eat, all you really are interested in is what did the blood sugar do afterwards? If the glucose went up and stayed up, you know for a fact there wasn't enough insulin given. If your glucose spikes up really high and then comes back down again on its own, you know the timing was off. Having those lines showing how much IOB there is, how much COB there is, to me, eh, it doesn't contribute anything to, to the analysis of the data. It just makes it more complicated to look at. And if anyone disagrees, feel free to share you know, what you learned from that. But personally, I don't think it contributes anything worthwhile. I can see that he had a three-hour entry but his food may or may not have digested in three hours. He uses three hours for everything. So it wouldn't have really helped here. All right, so those are the day-to-day -day reports. If you scroll all the way to the bottom of the day-to-day -day reports, you'll find some secret hidden information. This is like discovering plutonium. This is a treasure chest and it's hidden away at the very bottom of the day-to-day -day graphs. And there's no place else in the reports to find this. It's your total daily insulin average. In his case, he's averaging 94 units a day. It's your allocation of basal versus bolus, very valuable. It's his average carb entries per day. It's very valuable information. And you can only find it here. It's like you have to get out your shovel and dig way to the bottom of the day-to-day -day graph to get to this data. It's the only place you can find it. The total daily insulin average is very helpful for helping us estimate your sensitivity. There's a formula we use, it's called a 1700 rule. You typically take a person's total daily insulin, divide it into 1700. It gives us a good estimate of what their daytime sensitivity or correction factor is gonna be. It may be different at night. Many people are more sensitive to their boluses at nighttime. But during the daytime, that 1700 formula typically works pretty well. Then when we look Gary, at- we have a, I'm sorry, we have a question in the chat asking, does the type of insulin affect the absorption times for food? The absorption time for food is not affected. I mean, you can change your insulin algorithm based on the kind of insulin you use. The food acts independently. If it's a high glycemic index kind of food, you need to use like one hour. If it's a lower glycemic meal or a very high fat meal, a long drawn out meal or a very large meal, then you ought to be using five, six, seven hours for absorption time. 
So th the allocation of basal and bolus is another important thing to look at. For most people who are eating at least a modest amount of carbohydrate, we're usually looking for the basal to be around 40%, give or take, of a person's daily total. This person's basal is 80%, and it's that way mainly or for two reasons. One reason is often not bolusing for his food. The second reason is he was using the temp basal branch. And when you're using the temp basal branch, it's only going to use basal increases to fix highs. It's not going to be using automated correction boluses. So that can skew that percentage a little bit. You can see his base basal. If he was getting his standard basal rate, then it would be 34% of his day's total, which is a little more reasonable, maybe a bit on the low side, but it's reasonable. Uh, for people who are entering all of their carbs, you know, 85 grams is not a lot. If that was truly what he was eating through the course of the day. That's not even enough to meet a person's basic metabolic needs. And that tells me that some of the protein he eats is probably also contributing to a blood sugar rise. Once we get up into the you know, 100, 120 grams a, a day and more, then the protein tends to not have much impact on the glucose level. But at very low carb intake, we see more contribution from protein in terms of raising a person's blood sugar. Okay, so what else we got? Uh, I'm not, I don't look at the daily stats a whole lot because on any individual day, bizarre things can happen. Uh, similarly, this type of report, this hourly stats, you know, these are just averages over a period of time. Yeah, I can see overall what the pattern is, but I, I learn a lot more with this week to week report. Oh, I got to get all the days back. It doesn't matter. Got to hit show. Mary, we have a question asking for people who are using MMOL, that ratio you talked about, the 1700 rule, uh, mm -hmm. total 80 dose. Thank you. Yeah, it becomes 100. <laughs> now you divide your total insulin into 100 if it's if you're uh, in measuring in millimole. Thank you. 95, 100, something like that. Now, I, I can learn a lot more looking at this than looking at just a, a bunch of boxes. A bunch of boxes, it doesn't tell me if somebody's post meals are spiking. If they vary their meal times, I can't really tell what's happening after those meals. Uh, I can't tell if there was an outlier that skewed things quite a bit. You know, to, for me, that, that's where this week-to-week -week report, the spaghetti graph, tells me a lot more of what I really need to know about. You can also on here see cause and effect relationships. If there are lows, you can see, well, what preceded them? Was there a very high? Maybe the correction was too aggressive. Was a low preceded by another low? Perhaps they're not treating with enough carb or treating quickly enough. Uh, do lows result in highs afterwards? You can see that on, on the, the spaghetti graphs pretty clearly. You can't see much of, of any of that on these summary type reports. And I have a similar issue with the, it's called the AGP report that a lot of other programs generate. Is there not a lot different from this? I mean, it, it doesn't al allow you to see any detail. You just kind of get an overall blob picture of what's going on through the course of the day. You can't learn much more than that. Mm. The last thing I tend to look at is called the loopalyzer. The loopalyzer lets us see if there are patterns to the adjustments that loop is making. We can see if loop is frequently raising or lowering insulin delivery at certain times of day. This takes a little bit of time to generate. There's a lot of number crunching that the system does. It's still loading. I've heard that lupalizer is more for AAPS than for loop. Is that true? No, it's also, if you know what to look for, it's also very helpful in loop. And it can be used whether somebody's on uh, the autobolus branch or the temp basal branch of loop. 
if I may, just John Gaffel, uh, I think you may be referring to auto tune, which is only useful for AAPS. Oh, maybe so. Okay, so here is the auto bowl of uh, the uh, loop ELISA report. Uh, I'm only concerned with this one report here that has the tiny orange bars. Some are above you know, baseline, some are below baseline. If you're using uh, the temp basal branch, you'll often see a lot of time below and a lot of time above the baseline. In his case, he was only using the the temp basal branch part of the time. But let's say he was using the temp basal branch all the time. So it was raising the basal when he's high, lowering the basal when he's low. We only have a couple of minutes through the course of the day where it's typically lowering the basal. Almost all the time, it's raising the basal above his preset levels. And that's, again, probably because either his standard basal settings are too low or he's not bolusing for his food. And that's more likely the case. It looked like there were a lot of meals that just weren't being entered. The time of day where we're seeing the most increase is in the evening. So time-wise, it's between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. There's a ton of increase, very big increases being made to the basal delivery by loop. So it means that the dinner boluses either aren't happening or like we saw before, the carb ratios may be insufficient. If I see big sections of the day where it's commonly lowering the basal, that tells me, well, either the, the meal bolus beforehand is too aggressive or the basal setting that's in the pump, his standard basal setting during that time is too aggressive. So that's where the loopalizer is useful, just for evaluating the, the meal dosing, the basal dosing, based on the kind of adjustments that loop is having to make. So it's broken down into five minute intervals. So there's 12 intervals in each one hour time frame. So just in this interval, let's say at 1 a.m., from 1 a.m. to 1.05 a.m., uh, on average, it's bumping the basal up by about a unit per hour, almost a unit per hour. Just between the time of 7 a.m. to 7.05 a.m., on average, it's lowering the basal by about a unit per hour, but it's only doing that for 10 minutes a day. All right, so that's what that represents. Okay, so that is kind of my tour of Night Scout. So when I'm analyzing the data, that's the process I go through. I check the settings first in the profiles. I go to the week to week to get a big picture look at what the pattern is like through the course of the day. I get some of the statistics overall for the last couple of weeks. I go to the day-to-day -day reports to get more granular and see what's happening after specific meals, what's happening overnight, what's happening immediately after meals pattern-wise. And then I might go to the loopalizer just to see and confirm some of what I learned earlier about what adjustments is loop having to make to try to get the glucose to target. Does that make sense? Gary, I noticed that you didn't have any notes in there for anything particular as types of meals or exercise, um, which I, I said as is, is um, mm -hmm. an IFTTT um, yeah. add-in, but is that something helpful that you encourage your your um, patients to well, use? I'm actually I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, it is very helpful. Although sometimes people get a little too obsessive and put too many notes in. They start to overlap on the screen. That's when I know that's just too many notes. Uh, I think it's okay to log things like exercise because it's there's no other way to know what's happening. You can log unusual things like if you're ill, if your menstrual cycle starts, um, if you're highly stressed, uh, 
but unusual circumstances. You don't really need to know about every detail about a person's daily life, just the unusual things. But you know, the, the physical activity part I, I find is critical. There's no other way to know when somebody's being more active and less active unless it's noted in there. Or if they're using a temp override that would denote that. Is it, um, can you see that at all in any of the reports, what, what your notes are? Yeah, it shows up in the day-to-day -day reports. The day -to -day. Okay. Thank you. So I, okay. um, sometimes I have a lot to say. <laughs> and um I'll I'll use a note and then a uh, about separate things, but I'll use a note and I'll use an announcement so I can see both of them. I don't put a lot of notes in there, but sometimes they do stack up like that. What is the difference between the purpose for a note and for an announcement? You talking about a meal announcement where you have a temporarily lower target? Announcement. announcement. Yes, an announcement. Mm -mm. Not a meal announcement, just one that shows up as a bar on in the graph. You can get back to me on that. Yeah, the announcement, it does the same thing. It just shows up, like you said, as a bar on the graph. And if you're stressed during that time interval, it's good to know that. If you're having a root canal, it shows up on there. I know why the glucose spiked up the way it did. Context is extremely helpful. At least I like to see that. A lot of providers don't want that much detail, but I know diabetes is about details. There's a lot of things going on in the course of the day. You can't just look at a glucose graph and know what was going on unless we know what that, that person was living through through the course of that day. So yeah, I do find those announcements to be integral. Again, but don't go crazy. Just unusual things, not the usual went grocery shopping and then I sat and watched TV. That's stuff I don't need. But, you know, if I went outside and mowed the lawn for two hours, that's useful. Here, you mentioned when you were going through the loopalizer that <clears throat> one issue could be either um, carb ratio or basal. What, what reports would you look at to try and figure out which it is? Well, one thing I'd look at is the proportion, the allocation of basal and bolus. If somebody's basal insulin is making up more than 50% of their day's total. And there's a chance they're either getting too much basal or not enough bolus insulin. If it's less than 30% of their day's total, I think they're either getting too little basal or too much bolus. That's just kind of cues me in. But otherwise, I would have to look at the day-to-day -day graphs then to see what was happening. So overnight, for example, if they're constantly having the system give them extra basal to keep them steady, that tells me their standard basal, the, their program basal rate is insufficient. After meals, it's very hard to tell. I usually will focus on the bolusing to control what's happening after meals. If there's a spike right after the meal that settles back down, it's not so much a dose issue as a timing issue. But if they go up and stay up three, four hours later, if it hasn't come down, then it's almost always a, a, a carb ratio issue that's causing that. And if they go into low after the meal, it's also the, the, the carb ratio is too aggressive or the insulin was given too, too much was given up front they may have needed to use the absorption time more lately. All right. So this is Carol. I have, oh, sorry. Go Ellen. ahead, Carol. No, go ahead. I, I have one point, just a clarification for people watching this video in the future, that the auto bolus branch and the temp basal branch are all one branch now. And, you know, loop three is, has both delivery methods. And then separately on the issue of looking at the basal bolus split, my understanding is so in loop, because of the way it suspends basal right after you record a meal bolus, that that split that you see in Night Scout isn't really all that accurate and shouldn't be relied upon. Is that a misunderstanding on my part? Well, it depends on the absorption times that you're using. Pick it, pick, say I'm using five hours, three hours, you know, but yes, for sure, basal gets suspended. For most people that I help, it gets suspended right after they record. Mm -hmm. recorded meal and could be suspended for a half an hour or more 
Yeah. It also depends where the glucose is going into the meal. And the exactly. But you know, you're you're right. Uh, it's not as straightforward with a program like Loop uh, to understand the basal bolus allocation. But once you start getting to extremes, where the basal is such a high proportion or such a low proportion of a person's daily total, it means that there's something funked up about their settings. Okay. Uh, they really need to be looked so at. With something and like they, Loop, they talked about in the, la the session I did last month. You know, the, the most important thing to do, even before starting Loop, if you can, is to get your standard basal settings correct. If your standard basal settings are incorrect and are not matched to your body's typical needs, then Loop is going to be just constantly chasing rising and falling blood sugars. It's going to be putting out fires constantly instead of doing what it's meant to do, which is maintain you in a decent range. You get this constant rise and fall. I'm seeing this with Omnipod 5, and I see it with the Medtronic system, where they establish a flat basal profile. And young people who need higher basals in the evening always rise in the evening before it kicks in. And even adults who need a peak in the early morning hours, they don't get that until the blood sugar starts climbing and it fixes it. So getting your standard basal rates correct by you know, going through the, you know, some fasting tests, I think it's still very important. We have a question about uh, total daily. In Night Scout, it never matches the Apple, uh, Apple Health or Tide Pool. Um, the the basils don't match. And the question is, do you notice this or is that just him? Um, or do you find it close enough to make decisions from? No, I almost never compare the two. So I don't know. I'm either See. looking at Tide Pool or I'm looking at Night Scout. Honestly, I look at Night Scout. If I have an option of looking at Night Scout, I look at Night Scout. Yeah, so the the it's known that the basal reported by Night Scout is not as accurate as what's in Apple Health or as an accurate as in Tide Pool. However, it's in the five to ten percent range. It's not it's not a huge difference, but Night Night Scout has a a way of accounting for basal that um, doesn't take into account that basals aren't always exactly five minute intervals. Mm. So That's if you want to know who to believe, believe Apple Health, believe Loop, and believe Typo. And believe Marion. Believe <laughs> <laughs> Marion. For for somebody who eats lower carb, um, should the basal bolus ratio be skewed? Yeah, it's going to be different. Yeah, you're going to get a higher proportion of basal if you're on a very low carb diet. Likewise, I got some teenagers I work with. They're eating 400 grams of carb a day they're bolusing a lot and they're active. So their basal needs are relatively low. Kate, yeah, you always have to look at the, you know, the individual case and don't, don't make too many assumptions. Um, we have a question about notes being edited. Can they be edited? And I will say, yes, they can. <laughs> Ellen? Uh, well, someone was asking about how much is it okay for your blood sugar to go up after a meal and for how long? You know, it's different for different people. In some cases, we try to keep the glucose from peaking above 160 or 180. Other cases, it's fine to go up as high as 200. Young kids, you know, low 200s are perfectly acceptable. It, it really depends on the person and what their goals are. But those temporary blood sugar spikes after meals, they're, they're harmful. They have their own independent effect on blood vessel health. The glucose variability that they cause, it creates something called oxidative stress in the bloodstream, leads to some damage in the blood vessels. And it, it just doesn't feel good. You know, when we spike up, we get very sluggish. And then when we drop quickly, we feel like we're low and we're not. So it, it affects our day-to-day -day life. So trying to minimize those post-meal spikes should, should be a, a goal for everyone. It's not just the, you know, the average now, you know, we want to spend that time in range and have as little variability as possible. Luckily, there's a lot of good ways of managing those post-meal peaks. We could do a whole session on that another time, if you like. 
I just want to jump in because I, I've heard you mention this to me um, in terms of the host systems that you you tend to like. I, I know what you use at IDS. Um, can you speak to that on a, a new user and how they might set up Night Scout? So when you say systems, you're talking about uh, data software Database, programs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I like Night Scout, but I recognize Night Scout it wasn't really designed for the typical consumer. You know, the language that it uses, where the data is found, the layout, the presentation, um, it was designed more for people who think like engineers. It, it's just the truth. Um, and if you know what you're doing, you can find things, you can do the analysis, but it, it's certainly not a you know, ready for prime time kind of program. It needs some work. Um, I, I use the Gluco program quite a bit uh, with people who are on Tandem and Omnipod, et cetera, even with the people on the InPen. Uh, I do like the Gluco program. I get a, a lot of the same reports that Night Scout will generate. Um, I use uh, Tide Pool. I use Tide Pool sometimes. It, it doesn't give me the sensor overlay, the spaghetti graph. I, I really like that one. Um, there's what a lot of wasted space. What about Night Scout Reporter? Right. Do you use that? Are you familiar? No. John, John mm -hmm. Gaffel just, just mentioned that in chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and in terms of setting up, there, there are, you can set up Night Scout, but you need a repository and you need either to pay or somehow get a, a free, free service. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I mean, if you've got a good computer engineering background, you can tweak your way around it. If not, uh, Night Scout Pro is a group that I, I, we've done some work with. They, they can set this up for people very quickly and very inexpensively. Uh, another one is T1PAL. T1PAL, it's a, you know, they do it on a contract basis where you can hire them to create your Night Scout link. And you know, they'll help you maintain loop updates and things like that as well. So you know, take advantage of those. Um, they 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 can really be useful. You know, some some cost more than others, but you know, if you really are, want to manage yourself well and be able to analyze your data, it's it's certainly worth getting. But Loop and Learn's done a, a lot of um, risk reporting about what the options are and what the costs are. Um, T1 Pals at the very high end of cost. Um, Night Scout Pro at the bottom end. Of, uh, so it it varies, but it, there is a cost to data storage. Mm which is where that comes in. Um, I, we're kind of closing in, Tina or Ellen, are there a few more quest, questions? And then I've got some comments at the end. There's one about um, a person's temp basal graph in Loopalyzer not having zero for a baseline. And then why does why does her uh, left axis temp basal show only negative values? What might be going on there? If it's only showing negative values for temp basal, it's possible the max basal is or the maximum allowable basal is set too low and it's not allowing allowing it to increase the basal. Oh, uh, it's an auto bolus, right? There you go. Yeah, if you're on auto bolus, you're not going to get anything positive. Oh, okay, so that's yeah. zero, zero or negative by definition. Yeah, so the it's only increases are going to be in the form of boluses instead of basal. Makes sense to me. Uh, one person asked, if you are spiking after a meal and it's a timing issue, what do you think is the best way to deal with that? There's about a dozen different ways to deal with it. Different things work better for different people. Giving your insulin earlier makes a big difference. Um, you know, the, the, the meal announcement in loop, I've tried it. I don't know that it makes that big a difference. Some people say it does help where you, you, know, you have a lower target for a little while going into the meal. So it starts increasing your basal delivery. But I think ultimately timing the insulin right is, is the easiest way to, to counteract that. But I said, that there's a dozen different ways to manage that. We could spend a whole session on it if you want to. We There's so fun. much to learn. <laughs> <laughs> new stuff. And I want you everyone on the on the program to know I recognize that 
looking at your own diabetes data may not be your idea of fun. Believe me, it's no one's idea of fun. Uh, if you'd rather be doing other things, or if you feel like you can't be really objective looking at your own data, it's, I, I feel that way. I don't look at my own. I have someone else do it. Uh, you know, call on us. It, that's that's what we do. You know, we'll learn about you, learn about what your management approach is, what your interests are. We can do a good objective look at your data and give you some some recommendations based on it. Here's a really, really good question um, from a mom of a little looper. Which view or which report do you look at to to find growth spurts and onset of puberty? Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to show up in any of the Night Scout reports. It requires what's called a longitudinal graph. You're actually better off going into Dexcom Clarity for something like that. You can get a couple, like three months of data on one graph. And if you see an inflection point where the things are pouring along fine and then boom, things start going up, that's usually a sign Usually it's a sign that growth, that this growth hormone's kicking in. Uh, with women in there you know, who have menstrual cycles, it can also produce the kind of blips for a few days, sugars going up, but that's, that's really the best way to do it. I forgot about that, that graph. That is an amazing graph. Okay, I'm going to start to click. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. It sounds like Carol wants to say something. No, what? I responded in chat. I'm all set. It's in chat. It's in chat. You're all set. Okay. Um, Got it. Uh, it. It was a comment made by Don Geffio, um, and I think it's a kind of interesting comment and, and worth repeating. The loop app will only show the previous two hours on the main display, and since midnight in the landscape mode display, Night Scout is essential to be able to go back. And his other comment, which I absolutely love, which is uh, using loop without Night Scout is like driving and looking only 10 feet in front of your car. Um, that is the reason we recommend people use Night Scout. We're asked that very often, why do I need it? Um, because oh, it, otherwise you're driving in the dark, not seeing ahead of you. Um, we try to answer all those questions and what we're doing as a result of, of tonight's presentation with Gary, uh, we're hosting an open mic night on Monday. Uh, so watch for the announcements in Loop and Learn. Um, that we'll try to talk a little bit more about Night Scout and answer as many questions as possible. This will not be recorded because it's open mic and you should feel free to oh, say whatever you want. And we do not share that further on in, in our YouTube. But this tonight's event will be edited and hopefully uh, computer willing and time willing, it will be up by tonight or first thing tomorrow morning. So um, Gary, this has been absolutely extraordinary and important and uh, everyone knows where to reach Gary if you don't um, Gary can you put your your contact in chat yes, and thank you and um, we'll be seeing you again in a month um, you're helping us educate the, the, the community and this is all out of the goodness of Gary's heart and his time and we appreciate that we're learning Everyone's real excited about this. So thank you. Thank you so very much. Have a I good appreciate day. you organizing all of this, Joanne. You deserve a lot of credit as well. Thanks, Gary. All right. Y'all have a good evening. Be safe.